By the way, have you switched off your smartphone? Is it muted? Flight mode? If not, then maybe your battery runs empty. Because in your smartphone, there are around one billion switches, electronic switches, and they like to do computation, they like to work. One billion switches in your cool smartphone. But what happens if those one billion switches switch one billion times a second? Your smartphone gets really hot. And that happens. That happens all the time when you not switch, on, switch off your smartphone. Your battery is empty, it's heating up a bit. But why is that so? Because at the very heart of your smartphone, there are electronic switches connected in series. A pretty simple circuit I brought with me. Two switches in series, we connect them to the battery. The upper switch we call a digital one, so it's connected to the plus pole. The minus pole is connected to the battery, of course, and there is a zero. So one and zero, digital numbers, we do computation with switches in the end. And that's an inverter already. I will show you how it works. We put a button there. It's not pressed yet. It's an input with digital zero. The output is digital one because it's connected to the plus pole. Now we press the button. The upper switch opens, the lower one closes, we are connected to the minus pole. This is an inverter. Input one, output zero. So in digital computation, everything is about one and zero. And this is an inverter. One goes to zero, zero goes to one, as shown here. Zero to one, one to zero. So far, so good. This circuit is quite important, 10,000 times on your smartphone. Everything seems to be fine. One switch is open, the other one closed. The battery is not discharging, no current flow. But if we look in more detail, what happens if we now switch a billion times a second? What happens? Oh, there is a lot of losses. There is current flowing because two switches are closed at once. They are switching so fast to a closed, short circuit, current flow, your smartphone heats up. Dynamic power loss, we call this. Second problem, those switches became smaller and smaller and smaller. They are that small that insulators do not behave like insulators anymore. Current is flowing everywhere. We have leakage. Leakage power losses, a problem in nowadays electronics. Third problem, have you ever took out the battery of your smartphone, all the data is lost. Taking out a battery of an electronic circuit, all the data is lost. So it's not a stable state, it's discharged. Everything is going to ground state. So we cannot use those configurations, those switches to, to store data. But we can do better, and I will show you how. How can we do better? No current shell flow. No data loss should appear. Take something else. Don't use electronic switches. Take magnets. They are stable. They have a north and a south pole. Take magnets instead of electronic switches and keep the principle of a switch. It's very simple. Switching on, switching off. A magnet, north pole, south pole. Very easy. You can do it a billion times. Magnets you might know from the fridge at home. Yeah, maybe that's a bit smaller at home on your fridge. They stick postcards there. You might use magnets to sort metal scrap. You might use magnets in your electrical vehicle. So magnets are everywhere, but they are big. We want to do something else. We want to teach magnets new tricks. We want to teach magnets new tricks by doing them on a chip. We try to do the magnets on a chip, make them very tiny, and here we go with computation. 
So don't use them just for putting them on a fridge. Nanomagnets are very small. I'd like to convince you that they, they can be very small. Those ones are millimeter size, centimeter size, too big. Make them 1,000x smaller. 1,000x smaller means the thickness of your hair. Still too big, don't put hairs on a chip, it's not working anymore. Make them smaller, 1,000x smaller again, and you end up in the nano world. That's where we go, 40 nanometers apart, very thin magnets, only a couple of atoms thick. That's where we go. But why is a magnet a switch? Well, you would say, for switching a magnet, I turn it round. Good idea. But that's not working on chip. On chip, you cannot just rotate a magnet. You have to do something else. We have North and South Pole, yes, but we cannot rotate. So we do something else. We do something like reverse the poles, North and South Pole, by magnetic fields. We have to do it on chip without rotation. And this is explained here. Take a small island, a magnet, North and South Pole, and tickle with gallium ions. At one edge, you shoot some ions in the material, and there the magnet changes its properties. We apply a magnetic field. And then, in a north pole, we can generate a south pole. So within a big pole, we generate a smaller south pole. We trigger it, we nucleate. We apply more magnetic field, what happens? Well, the domain, this north, the south pole is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In the end, the full magnet is switch. That's what we wanted. But how do magnets talk to each other? This I have to explain again. Two magnets. If you have opposite poles, they repel. You know this from physics class, I guess. They repel, Whoa. very unstable. You turn them around, they click together. But they talk by magnetic fields. Magnets talk by magnetic fields, but both magnets are talking, not just one. Both are talking to each other. We cannot use for computation. We have to do something else. We take again the gallium ions, we tickle the area with gallium, and we have now one speaker, the left one, and one listener. So the speaker is talking to the listener. And that's very important because we now have an input. Remember the inverter I showed you. We have an input and an output that's needed for computation. So let's go back to the idea of an inverter. Two magnets close together, one is tickled with gallium, the other one not. One is the speaker, the other one is the listener. That's an idea, that's a sketch, we can draw it easily. But that's the experiment. We put those magnets on a chip, and here you can see a scanning electron micrograph, so scanning electrons for doing this image. And you can see five magnets in a row. Five magnets in a row, a tenth of the thickness of your hair. But there is more inside. If you zoom in to the third and the fourth magnet, you see something very small. You see the input, fork-like. You see the output, tip-like. And the magnets are 40 nanometers apart, 40 nanometers in between. This is really nanotechnology. And so the full experiment looks like this, five magnets in a row. We irradiated with gallium ions, those, those magenta-like spots. They couple by magnetic fields. The last magnet is feeding back the information to the input. And here I highlighted North and South Pole for you. If you look at the first and the second magnet, North Pole up, not very good. Instable situation. The magnetization wants to align anti-parallel. We apply a field pulse in the experiment. Here you are. The second magnet switches to South Pole. Now we have two South Poles. 
what to do. Instable situation, two south poles up, it has to switch. We apply a magnetic field pulse, the next one switching to north pole. And so on, and so forth. Now information is flowing back to the input, to north poles, to south poles. And so on, and so forth. So you can see, we can propagate information from left to right. We have digital numbers, one and zero, north and south pole, and the information is propagating in a direction needed for computation. Very important. So we have five in a row, and we call it information flow at that point. But that's not sufficient for computation. You need more. What else do we need? We have to combine information. We have to, to have several inputs and one output. And that's done with this gate, the basic building block of digital computation in magnetic devices. Three inputs, they generate stray fields. The stray fields couple into this gallium spot. There is the listener. And here is the truth table. That's all possible states. First row, zero, zero, zero. That means North Pole, North Pole, North Pole. Output, you guess it, south. Of course, it has to be south. It's the opposite of the majority of the inputs. Second row, two inputs still north. Two times north, the output has to be south. The majority of the inputs is still north. Output aligns anti-parallel. And you guess the second last row. Two inputs are on a south pole. The output, north pole. Opposite to the majority of the input. What can we do with that? We combine information. We do digital computation here already, but let's do something really complex. A free input gate. You know how it works. The five input one, well, take two more inputs. That's easy, isn't it? Two gates, but let's connect them. That's important. Two gates, but we need connections. They have to talk to each other by connections. And that's what we did. This is the structure. You see the gates, three inputs, five inputs. The gates are connected. And we reorganize inputs and outputs. Now we define three inputs and two outputs. And look what this circuit is doing. It's doing an addition of digital numbers. This circuit is doing exactly what you see below. One plus one plus zero, it's zero. That's digital computation, yes. And remember the carry bit. The carry has to be one. So remember that there was an overflow, so I remember carry bit one. Don't care too much about the details. It's doing an addition of numbers. This simple circuit, and that's the full, full truth. We measured it. We see the poles, the green ones and the red ones. It works really. And it's not just a drawing, it's real measurements. And we fabricate those magnets in our lab at university. So we put those magnets on a sample and measure it. So the magnets might be right in the middle of this chip but we don't see them. We need microscopes and special microscope for magnetic materials. We need tiny coils to generate field pulses. We need a big magnet and so on and so forth. And some of our setups are homemade. Master students and PhD students and researchers in the lab we built our microscopes ourselves, and we measure magnet switching, and we measure how reliable they are. Now it's time for a summary and a comparison. I showed you 
quite a complex gate, maybe, a full adder. It consists of five magnets, no leakage, no data loss. You might say, well, complex, yes, but what about the electronic full adder with electronic switches, 28 transistors, with leakage and data loss, so it's not easier. But this comparison is very much unfair because all those electronic switches are already in your smartphone. They are mass-produced, billions of them, on your chip. And our magnets are not. We are doing university research. We look what could happen tomorrow. We try to improve technology at least a bit, keeping your smartphone cooler, not discharging the battery so much. For example, we tried to stack the magnets, we, we tried to stack them on chip. Seems to work. We try to combine memory, each magnet has memory function, with computation, each magnet can compute. So we try to combine in one device. And maybe there are some tricks around we haven't thought of so far, but they might be there. We might teach them really new tricks. And if you now say, well, this is all too complicated. Maybe next time when you come here and you're asked to switch off your mobile, then I can say, well, don't worry, relax, sit back. There are billions of magnets already on your smartphone. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>